Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Wednesday, July 31st, 2019 Market Watchers Live Show with your host, Tom Boley and Aaron Swinlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. Well, it is Fed Day, um, and this can be a very exciting day, as we found out back in December. And again, at the beginning of May, uh, will the Fed do what it needs to do? We'll talk about that in a bit. But currently, Got the Dow Jones Industrial Average up 25 points, the S&P 500 up four, the NASDAQ up 24. And again, second day in a row, we're seeing some strong outperformance by the small cap Russell 2000 index. We haven't seen a whole lot of that in 2019, but we are seeing it here as we get set for the Fed meeting. The 10-year Treasury yield down three basis points, 2.03%. Uh, maybe one last signal to the Fed that we need to be cutting rates. Volatility index was up quite a bit earlier today, challenging the double top we saw in July, but it has backed off. That's good news for equities. A break and close above that 1475 to 15 area would be a bit more bearish in the near term. Energy having a strong day today. Crude oil prices are up this morning. Real estate also having a strong day. Uh, communication services getting a little bit of uh, love in the aggressive sectors today. Communication services doing well. To the downside, consumer staples, the weakest area of the market, down a, uh, 1%, but it did break out to a new high yesterday, so maybe a little bit of profit taking there. Renewable energy, continuing its strong leadership in 2019. This has been the best industry group in 2019, and it is extending its lead with a huge move higher today. Specialty finance, after sideways consolidating for a while, continuing its leadership, breaking out today uh, up more than 3%. Computer hardware, of course, computer hardware is doing well today because Apple reported last night, beating top line, beating bottom line, great report, stock cleared overhead resistance. I expect it will go higher in time. End phase, this is a renewable energy stock. Look at this company after reporting earnings, stocks up over 30% today. This is actually one of the top 10 stocks in my aggressive portfolio, stock that's been outperforming Renewable Energy Group, which has been the best performer in the market this year. Today, we found out why Enphase, a blowout report. That is the update for today. Aaron, welcome back, number one. And number two, you're back on a good day because it's the Fed. Oh, yes. It looks like it's going to be an interesting one. I do miss the beach from yesterday, but, you know, I'll, I'll get back there eventually. Well, life is a beach, right? And right, we got, and we got the Fed on deck, um, and it always scares me. Usually, the Fed meetings don't scare me, but uh, Powell scares me because <laughs> he kind of goes goes and does his own thing, and really doesn't take much of a cue sometimes from the bond market, which has been screaming for a rate cut. And I think just about everybody on the planet is expecting at least twenty five basis point cut today. If he doesn't deliver. I would look out below. I think the market is not going to like it. We saw what happened to the stock market when Powell didn't cooperate back in December. And same thing early May. I don't know if you remember, but that was the meeting where he said inflate, the lower inflation was transitory. And I don't know what chart he was looking at, <laughs> but the charts I've been looking at show the dollar continuing to strengthen, meaning pressure on commodities to the downside. And even with a strong labor market, we're not seeing wage inflation. So I don't know where he's talking about the transitory, whole transitory thing. Um, but he did come off of that a little bit at the last meeting, and that kind of set up for a rate cut today. Hopefully he comes through. We'll see. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have a special guest today. We've got Jake Bernstein. Jake, how are you doing today? Doing good. Thanks for inviting me. Appreciate it. Yeah, um, I know you've got an interesting uh, um, presentation for everybody and some of the things you've learned over the years and some of the tips that you want to give our, our listeners. So uh, looking forward to that. We'll do that in about 10 minutes, if that's Thank good. Thank you. All Absolutely. Right. Awesome. All right, Aaron, what do we got? All right. Upcoming schedule. Roman is going to be with us tomorrow. August seasonality is Friday. My dad's coming in on August 7th, so don't want to miss that. And then Another tech titan, John Murphy, will be coming in right after that. Today is a busy schedule, as always. We do have Jake getting ready to come in and talk to us after our news. 10 and 10, Magellan Health Services is the first one, MGLN, and that will wrap it up. So let's go ahead and get it started. How about some technical news? Sounds good. All right, well, first, let's take a look at the uh, economic 
uh, news that was out today. We did get the July ADP employment report. That is a precursor to the non-farm payrolls on, out on Friday. They came in about as expected. Uh, sometimes we get some big moves one way or the other, not today. 156,000 versus the 155 expected. The big shocker to me was the July Chicago PMI. Second month in a row, we're below 50. Um, and today, it was actually expected to be just back above 50, a little bounce from what we saw in June. Instead, we took a tumble. And there's a lot of speculation. Maybe it's the trade war. Um, but the Fed's got to be looking at that. I mean, that is a horrible number. Uh, and of course, the Fed, the policy statement is out today at two o'clock. So we'll see what happens there. As far as the bond market goes, the 10-year Treasury yield continues to in this decline. Today, as I mentioned, top of the show, down about three basis points, back to 2.03%. I don't know what's going to happen here. We'll talk about it some more in a minute. But uh, the, right now, the bond market probably collecting its uh, or, or holding its collective breath. Um, let's take a look at some of the earnings reports. We had some big ones out overnight and this morning. Of course, none bigger than Apple. Uh, Apple did come out and report better than expected uh, revenues and um, bottom line earnings. Earnings came in at 218 versus 210. Amgen beat, Gilead Sciences beat. Uh, Mondelez International, a food products company, actually had been looking pretty good on their chart, only matched. Same goes for advanced micro devices. That was a, a big shocker. Full disclosure, I own it actually and held into its earnings report. So, of course, it went down. Um, Allstate uh, beat on their bottom line had a really nice reaction. We'll take a look at some of these charts in just a minute. Um, as far as the market goes, let's take a look at the S&P 500 here. Um, I think we got a nice little cup handle. If the Fed cooperates, I think we get a breakout. I think things would look pretty good. Also, I'd written about today the fact that the Russell 2000 was coming up into a key area where it has really struggled since October of last year. When the markets tumbled, we've seen the S&P, the Dow, the NASDAQ all go back to all-time highs, not the Russell 2000. And you can see this four, or excuse me, 1580 to 1620 area has been a solid wall. Every time we get up into this area, we sell off. I count in here about 10 times, nine times, probably others in here we could count as well. And today, we're getting another big move to the upside. You can see it breaking clearly into this resistance zone. A breakout above 1620 on the small caps would be very bullish because, remember, we're starting to see a little bit more strength in the transportation shares. And that's these are two areas that really haven't participated much. So if all of a sudden you get Russell 2000 going, you get the transports going, we're starting to see financials uh, moving up as well. Communication services, one of the leaders today just recently broke out uh, following the technology and consumer discretionary areas, industrials right on the verge. I mean, the market is poised for a big rally if the Fed cooperates. So we'll see not only what they do at two o'clock, but what they say. I think that's going to make a big difference. But just keep in mind, it was back in December, the bond market was sending the same message to the Fed. You need to lower and the Fed instead raised on December 19th um, and not only raised, but said they were going to be raising in 2020 a few more times. If you recall, stock market tumbled that next week. And then finally, bottom, we started heading up and the Fed came around and said, you know what? Eh, maybe maybe we won't raise next year. Maybe we're going to go ahead and wait for a while. And then it was at the end of April, early May, May 1st Fed meeting. The, the bond market, again, was sending that same mess message to the Fed. And the Fed said, nope, inflationary, you know, the fact that we moved lower, it's transitory. It's not going to last. We don't believe this is persistent. Well, anybody who looks at a dollar chart and has looked at one for the last eight years knows that there is an uptrend in play. Commodity prices continue to decline. Commodities, you know, uh, material stocks have been very big underperformers in the stock market for the last eight years. So finally, the Fed got it and the Fed uh, came back essentially and said, well, you know, at the at their latest meeting in June, they said, well, we're going to start taking a look at some things. You know, maybe things are changing a little bit. They've just been very, really slow and behind the eight ball. I'm not exactly impressed with, with what's been going on there. But anyhow, that's uh, something we're going to find out at two o'clock. If the Fed makes another mistake, I think the stock market tumbles. I don't think they're going to do it, but you might want to tune in at two o'clock. Uh, Apple, big earnings report. You can see the breakout. It looked really good to me 
heading into its earnings report in terms of relative strength. You can see that the group was moving higher. Apple, at this point with its earnings now, at a 52-week relative high versus computer hardware. And you can see computer hardware relative to the S&P was rising into this report. So I think all of that's good. One uh, report I wanted to just mention, not so good. Again, unfortunately, I'm, I own this one because I'm following my model portfolio, which tells me to hold until August 19th. Uh, AMD has gone against me, though, here with their earnings. Wasn't a bad report. They beat on the top line, but they only matched on the bottom line. And when you trade from 17 to 35 in about six or seven months, you need to do more than just match your estimates. I think traders are a little disappointed. We'll see whether or not that 50-day moving average holds. All right, back to the home page and the dashboard. Just wanted to point out that uh, Zendesk, and it was on here earlier. Just do have to take my word for it. Um, it was one of the movers today. Actually, I know why it's not. No, it, I've got the down because it was a down mover today. But let's uh, pull up that chart quickly. Um, okay, Zendesk. So you can see the big drop here in the scooter. I just, I'm looking at this and seeing this price support area that's held and gap support around 85. We're testing it on very heavy volume. You can see the rate of change is dropping, but it's hard to maintain rate of change when you're at 80% over 125 days. That's roughly about a half a year. You're not going to go up 80% every half year. So I'm not surprised it's been coming down, but with earnings and the pullback, I want to make sure that this area of support holds. So for that reason, it's your scooter mover of the day. All righty. It is time already for those upgrades and downgrades. I'm going to show you a couple here. First one I want to show you is BP. It was upgraded today by Jeffries from a hold to a buy. I like the look of this chart. You've got a PMO that is starting to rise, not quite giving us that buy signal, no crossover. But look at this uh, almost textbook double bottom coming in here. The only thing I would be a little concerned about is the fact we got a gap here. And there is the, you know, the possibility we might see this as an island reversal. But at this point, I'm looking at that double bottom as the dominant pattern here. We close that gap. Getting above that 20-day EMA, I certainly would like to see a move uh, above that 20-day EMA. Like I said, there, were no, there was not a uh, upside target, but I'm going to measure from the bottom of the pattern to the middle of the pattern, and that's gonna put us right about here at about $41. So that would be my upside target at this point for BP. And finally, let's go ahead and finish with T2 Incorporated. And I'm gonna show you a real interesting fact here. T2, TWOU was downgraded by six different agencies, and they had a dismal report, earnings report. It, you know, they're, they're in the educational space, of software and you know they have just been hurting and you can see on this chart i'm going to show you right there so we had a huge volume data today so far because of that terrible report we got the pmo sell signal coming in uh, well below the zero line nothing looking good here on this chart i mean we've got you know this was our trading range for a while and we've gapped down uh, more than that trading range just about the same amount, and there's the bottom currently. So all of these, interestingly, though, uh, moved to neutral positions, and uh, their price targets were right around 25 and about $29. So that's uh, where they're looking for it to move, obviously, to the upside. I don't like the chart. Maybe we are finally at a bottom there. Um, but at this point, I, I wouldn't be looking at that as the case. So... You can see we still have plenty of room to move lower back from when we had the IPO. And that is our, your final upgrade downgrade. Here are the lists, and we will be right back with Jake Bernstein after this message. I think StockCharts is a fantastic uh, platform, especially the fa fact that it's web-based. So um, on the car on the way here from the airport, I was bringing up my cell phone and I was looking up really beautiful charts to get a, a read on what happened. I looked at the market uh, summary page and then I'm drilling into individual charts. StockCharts is unique in that you've got 
all of the perspectives of uh, many of the technicians. A sincere desire to really help educate investors, and that's really critical. Stock Charts is unique because we combine the commentary, the education, as well as the tools in which you need in order to analyze the markets. All right, we are back right now, and I am happy to introduce Jake Bernstein. He has been in this business for, gosh, well, I know you, you do a weekly publication uh, that you've been doing since 1972. Uh, we're really glad to have you here and can't wait to hear what you have to say. You know more about me than I do. That's great. Thank <laughs> you. Thanks for the opportunity, and I want to commend you guys on doing such a quality job. The charts are beautiful. Indicators are clear and crisp. Love it. Love what you've done with the website. So thank you. thank you. I've been in trading for half a century and I'm beginning to feel it. In 25 minutes, it's difficult for me to share other than a few pearls of wisdom with you. Some of the things that have allowed me to accumulate a good amount of wealth. I'm a real trader. I'm not theoretical. I trade what I teach and I teach what I trade. And so let me give you some pointers that have made a difference for me. And I'm talking to you today, by the way, from Santa Cruz Mountains, California, where it is a couple of hours earlier than where you guys may be. The usual disclaimer and a little bit about me trading since 1967, written 40 books plus. You can read this later, not important. I just uh, want to share it with you just so that you'll see and I do know what I'm talking about. So a couple of things. Very important. I'm a numbers guy. I trade by the numbers. Certain numbers are very important to me. Other numbers are not. The bottom line is this. There's a huge amount of information available today all over the internet. If you go to Google and you type in day trading, you will get one million hits. So it's very difficult for the trader to know what to do, what to focus on, how to do this process correctly. So the amount of information is overwhelming and you need to focus. So let me give you some ideas about focus. I have a list of seven critical skills of trading. Let me go through them a little bit, give you some ideas. If there's nothing you come away from this meeting today with, except for what I call my trading model, which I will show shortly, I believe I've done you a great service and it has the potential to change your trading. If you're making money, you'll probably make more. If you're losing money, you'll probably turn it around and start making money. If you're making less money, you'll probably start making more money. So the important rules, you've got to find the right trades. I'll show you one way that I do it. You have to check your facts. There's a lot of information out there. You have to be really careful what you believe because most of it is incorrect information. If you start believing it and you see it enough, you're going to start believing it and it's not going to work for you. You have to formulate your plan. You've heard that a million times. I'll give you an example of what I mean. You have to follow through. Most people are familiar with one type of follow through, and that is take the money and run. They begin trading and they say, wow, I've made 500 bucks. I've never done this before. I'm going to get the money, take it before it disappears. Three days later, it would have been 1,500 or more for, for whatever they're trading. So you've got to be able to maximize your profit. There's two ways in which can, that can be done. You have to finalize. I'm going to show you two ideas on how to finalize. You have to keep a record of all your trades, win, lose, or draw. People say, I'm going to learn from, from my mistakes. Well, it's one thing to learn from your mistakes, but you can learn a whole lot from your profits. What did you do right? How did you do it? When did you do it? And you won't know unless you keep good records. And then you have to formulate your next action. Let me give you some ideas. So think about this. Imagine if you knew everything I'm going to show you on this list and the next one. Let me, let me explain to you what I mean. You need to know what stock, commodity, or forex to trade. That's very easy. Most people know that they say, I want to trade Google, I want to trade this, I want to trade that. Most people know that. You want to know whether to buy or sell. Again, reasonable. But do you know exact time to buy or sell within one minute or less? That is knowable information. You want to know your odds of success. In other words, what percentage of time historically has the strategy been correct? Most people don't know that. They talk about things they don't know about. They say, well, let's look, at the, let's look at the death cross, the golden cross. The question really is, 
what's the track record with the death cross? What's the track record with the golden cross? If you take your time and you put it on the computer and say, what percentage of the time has it worked? Oh, it's only been correct 37% of the time. Well, that's problematic for me because I like to be right more often than I'm wrong. But in the long run, it made money. So the question is, before it made money, did it kill you dead? That's very important to know. You want to know your average profit, your average loss, your stop loss or risk, your profit to loss ratio. Are you making more money when you're right than you're losing when you're wrong? The complete track record. I'm going to show you how to do that. Average profit, average loss in points and percent. The largest profit, the largest loss, the maximum drawdown, the maximum upswing. Let me talk to you about that. Consecutive losses, consecutive profits. Think about this. I have seen thousands of traders come into the trading arena, mostly for day trading, which I think is a losing proposition for most people, and say, I've got discipline. I went to the internet. I found a strategy. I'm going to use that strategy. They put $10,000 into an account, and the first thing that happens is they lose money on their first trade. They say, well, I came into this game knowing it wouldn't be perfect, so I'm okay accepting one loss. So I'm going to maintain my discipline and trade again. They trade again. They lose money again. Not unusual. They say, well, I lost twice in a row. I didn't expect it to be perfect. I've got discipline. I'm going to trade again. They trade again. They lose three times in a row. Again, not unusual within the scope of what we do. They say three times in a row, I can't deal with that. That's not right. I should have been doing better. They go back and they look at what they did and they say, if I had checked. If I change this or change that, I would not have lost money. Suddenly, they change their strategy. Then they lose the fourth time. There are very few traders I know or have met of the thousands of traders that I've coached personally who can accept four losing trades in a row. They say, I'm done with this game. I'm going to do something else. The fact of the matter is this, and we deal with facts, not with suppositions. If you test historically, Virtually any trading strategy, even the best ones, will lose six times in a row. Most people can't handle that emotionally, and they cannot handle that financially. So again, you need to know what you're getting into before you play a game. You want to know the accuracy of your strategy, how to minimize your potential loss, how to maximize your potential profit, when to move your risk effectively to zero. People say to me, Jake, what do you do? I say, I manage risk. I don't tell them I trade because if you tell them you trade, they're going to say, what should I do with my 401k? No matter what you tell them, you're going to be a villain. If it goes up and you tell them to, you told them to hold, you're, you're good, but they didn't get enough money. If you told them to get out and it goes up, you're a villain. They want to sue you. So the bottom line is this. My job is to manage risk. If I'm managing risk, keeping my losses to a minimum, and I've got a methodology that's even 50% correct, I will make money if I'm maximizing profit. So let's talk about that. What do I mean by managing risk? The bottom line is this. People say, I'm worried. I say, what are you worried about? They say, I'm worried about my position in the S&P. It's gone against me by 5,000 bucks. You say, well, what did you expect when you put the trade on? Well, I didn't expect it to go 5,000 bucks against me. You say, well, what did you expect? Well, I was expecting a little bit less than that. The bottom line is this. If you know your risk before you make the trade, you go into the trade with your eyes wide open and you say, yes, I expected a $5,000 loss. It's where I thought it would be. I'm not disappointed. I'm, not, I'm disappointed, but I'm not scared. Most people have no idea what's going to happen when they put on a trade. We need to know all these things ahead of time. The time to take your loss is before you make the trade. If you can't do that, the trade's not for you. So you want to know when to exit your position when move your risk effectively to zero, and all of these things. So imagine, most people don't even know one third of these things. The problem is lack of information in spite of all the information that's available out there. How are we gonna get that information? Let me give you an idea. Let's, let's switch for just one moment. Let's talk about what's very typical these days. I took some time to look at some information that was coming over the TV from one of the business shows. I'm going to share this with you. I call this my antithesis because this is what I'm not interested in doing. TV reporter, 
So where do you think the stock market goes from here? The broker dose analyst says, even though prices are making a standard bear market recovery, I ask the question, what by definition objectively is a standard bear market recovery? Then they say, it looks like the market wants to go higher from here expecting the Fed. I say, looks like what? What looks like something to me may look like something else to somebody else. How does the market know what it wants to do? Are we dealing with a living, breathing entity here? So basically what I've done here is I've highlighted in red all those things that don't make objective sense to me. Wants the, expecting the Fed to keep rates stable because they are thinking. How do we know what they're thinking? Then inflation is under control. What does under control mean? And my point is this. There's so much information coming across these days that's subject to interpretation. I can't deal with it. I can only imagine how a non-professional trader can deal with it. Probably not at all, which is why so many people are so confused. I just came back from teaching a master class at the Money Show in Chicago. The good news is there were at least 75 exhibitors there teaching their stuff. The bad news is 95% of it was not objective. It was unclear. And most people left more confused than when they got there. So that's problematic. So then we go on. Consequently, the Fed will probably not. What does that mean? be a factor in the underlying fundamentals. What are the underlying fundamentals in the foreseeable future? Can we define foreseeable future? I think you get the picture. The picture is this. Most of this kind of information, or on the next slide, which happened just a couple of days ago. Let me show you what I mean. Oh, come on, computer. I've eliminated the next slide. So the bottom line is this. The problem is there is a lack of clarity. If you can specialize and focus on a specific factor, a specific methodology that gives you most of the answers to the questions that I just raised before, you will do well. So ask yourself, honestly, do you have the information that I listed here? If you have even half of it, I would be surprised. If you have most of it, you will make money in the long run. Let's talk about charts. The beautiful charts that you get over here at stockcharts.com, and again, I say they're beautiful. People send me charts like this, and I say, excuse me, what the hell is this? It's so confusing to me. You want your charts to be clear, consistent, specific, not a 100 different indicators. Most indicators are based on price. Therefore, they will show you the same thing most of the time. So decide on your indicators, but then again, Go back and ask the question, do they work? So I say, forget about that, but do it clearly. One more thing I'd like to share with you. Since I live near Silicon Valley, I'm very often invited to give speeches or lectures or teach classes to a lot of the tech people who have businesses in the area. Frequently, I will go to these meetings. There'll be 30 or 40 engineers there, software engineers, computer hardware people who say, we're not making any money trading. How do we do it? I say, listen, guys, I've got a great idea. Let's go to the computer and ask the question. Does the death cross work? Does the golden cross work? Does the 20 MA over the 50 MA work? You say, how do we do that? I say, well, I've got a great idea. We can do it with a computer. And one of them puts up his hand and he says, what a fantastic idea. We can use computers for this. Cool. So the bottom line is this. We have the technology. Instead of dealing with things we don't know, let's find things that we do know. How often does it work? So I use the following strategy, and I want you to pay attention to this specifically. Because as I said, if I can teach you only one thing today, my trading model, I think that will make a difference if you're not already using it. There are three parts to every trade. What I call setup, step one, trigger, step two, and follow through, step three. Step one, setup. What is a setup? A setup is a pattern. There are literally thousands of patterns in the market. Patterns that most people are familiar with. Reversals, key reversals, breakouts, flags, pennants, double tops, double bottoms, you name it. That's the good news. You can see them on a chart. The bad news is, put them through the test, ask the question, are they totally objective? Can they be programmed? Can they be put in algorithms? If not, 
You can't test them. If you can't test them, don't trade them. My advice. So how do you test them? That's easy. Most people nowadays can write code. And if you can't, there's a number of programs available that will allow you to put everything in English and backtest it for you. So the question you're asking is, do the setups work? Most setups don't work. They look good. The idea sounds right, but they don't work when you backtest them. But a setup needs a trigger. So if I say to you, for example, there's high probability that stocks will move higher before a major holiday, which we know for a fact that 75% of the time before major U.S. holidays, stock market will close higher. And that's a very, fact, a very important factor because probability-wise, tested back to the 19 to the 1890s, it could only occur once in 10,000 times by chance. So that would be a setup. A setup needs a trigger. A trigger consists of a timing indicator. In other words, if I believe that something is likely to happen on such and such a date with a certain percentage accuracy, let's say that accuracy is 78%, I still have the probability of being wrong a certain percentage of the time. Can I reduce that likelihood of error? Yes, I use a timing trigger. These are things that people take for granted, but if you combine a timing trigger with a pattern, you increase your probability of success. Then we go to step three, follow through. Most people know two kinds of follow through, profit or loss. The bottom line is this, profit or loss is not where it's at. What's most important is this. If you have a profit, most people jump out of that trade immediately, as I said before, they say, I've got a $500 profit, I just put the trade on today, I'm getting out. The bottom line is this, if you trade multiple positions, get out of one, Reduce your cost effectively to zero. Reduce your risk effectively to zero. Keep the remainder of the position and give it an opportunity to work. Follow through consists of when to get out at a, at a loss, when to get out of part of your position at a profit, and most important, how to maximize the profit. The bottom line is this. Let me show you. At the end of the day, at the end of the year, 80% of your money is going to be made on 20% of your trades. Most of your trades are going to be break even. A small profit balanced off by a small loss. A larger profit balanced off by a larger loss. Then you're going to have your 20% big, big trades. You cannot get those trades to be big unless you stay in them. So you need to have a strategy to stay in them. Let me show you an example of something. If we take a massive amount of history, for example, the Dow Jones from 1901, 107 years forward to 2008, and the chart still looks the same today in 2019, you ask the question, has there been a pattern, a seasonal relationship in the Dow Jones? Does the market go up or down at certain times of the year? The answer is yes. Let's find those. So I have here a family of curves. Each one of them is a different segment of time the last 10 years, the last 25 years, the last 50 years, 75 years, and so forth. And you can see that in this family of curves, the relationship is the same. As remember, I'm a, young, I'm a numbers guy, so I like to look at numbers. Things mean something to me if I can see them on paper or on the screen. The typical behavior of stocks has been to start out toward the low end of the, of the range in December, January, to move higher into March, April, then to move sideways to lower until July, August, and then to make the big move up in September, October, November, December. This is not new information. Everybody knows it. The question is, how can we use this to our advantage? Can we zero in and find the right time of day, the right date to take advantage of this information within the guidelines that I presented earlier? So let me show you something. I'm going to go back and skip this for just a minute and go to this. If I go to the internet and go to a place called seasonaltrader.com, which is one of my websites, and I ask the question, in stock index futures, S&P 500 over here, for the month of July, has there been anything in the historical database going all the way back to the start of trading in S&P futures? And I want to stress something very important. Most people in this business don't like to go back too far. They like to look at the last few instances of a pattern. Because if they go back too far, they find out that it has deteriorated. It used to be good. It's been good for the last five years, 
going back 15, 20, 30 years, it's no good anymore. So the question is, do you want to hide your head in the sand or do you want to accept the fact that certain things work and certain things don't? So I want to ask a question. Back to the start of trading in S&P futures for the month of July in S&P, has there been anything historically that's been right 75% of the time that has lasted 25, 25 days or less? So I want to clarify what I'm talking about. I'm saying, computer, look at your huge historical database and ask the question, is there anything in July that's been right a high percentage of the time for less than 25 days? So the computer is going to give me an answer if there is an answer. Otherwise, it's going to be garbage in, garbage out. So what happens? Let me show you. I do the search. Computer comes back and says, historically, buying stocks, S&P specifically, end of day, July 11th, getting out end of day, July 15th, has been correct 75.7% of the time since the start of trading in S&P futures. So you'll notice we're going back a long time to get the data. Now, important to say, the past does not guarantee the future. But if you believe that history repeats itself, you've got something to work with. And I want to stress this approach, which is only one of my six approaches that I use for trading, answers all the questions that I asked before. Does it tell you whether to buy or sell? Yes, it says to buy. Does it tell you when to get in? Yes, July 11th. Does it tell you when to get out? July 15th. Does it tell you time of day? Yes, end of day, market on close. Does it tell you your risk? Yes, the stop is 1.5% of the entry price. Does it tell you the profit loss ratio? Yes, percentage win, average profit in S&P points, average loss and so forth. And it shows you the equity curve. So here I am, I've got a wealth of information. Now what, what do I do with this information is very important. I'll tell you why. Let's talk about psychology for a moment. My first profession was clinical psychology. My first job was working in a state hospital with psychotic patients. I do the same work now, but I get paid a lot better. So the bottom line is this. Looking at a cumulative performance chart like this, the mind begins to work and it says, well, as of last year, it was at its highest cumulative profit ever. It's working so well. It can't continue to work this well. The fundamentals this year are very different. That's always the excuse. This year is going to be different. I don't want to know about that. I just want to know my odds of success, but most of all, I want to know my risk. Can I afford the risk of this particular trade moving against me by 1.5%? So I don't look at the performance. I look at the risk. If the risk is okay, the trade is okay. But then I can do something else. This would constitute my setup. The pattern is good. I know the history. I can go to a chart. And by the way, this chart, easily done on stockcharts.com. This was the trade this year. The entry date, starting at the blue line, end of day, exit date, over here, trade is over. So when the trade is over, what do I do? I get out of part of my position. I trail a stop on part of my position, and over the next few days, I'm stopped out of my trade, one at break even, one at a trailing stop, and the trade is over for me. I then begin to look for another opportunity. The same strategy can be used in stocks. And by the way, here's the S&P trade. Every trade every year, all the way back to 1982. Very, very simple. Hey, Jay. Of, yes. Uh, I got a question for you because I'm a big seasonality fan. I think anybody watches Market Watchers Live knows I've got a spreadsheet. I go back. I probably don't go back as far as you do, but I'm also a numbers guy. And I know the 11th of the calendar of all calendar months tend to be pretty bullish yes. through, about, through about the 18th, 17th, 18th. So I understand the trade and what you like there in July, but why would you keep some of your position if the if your history is telling you that you want to get out on the 15th, why wouldn't you get out of all of it? Why would you have a trailing stop on, the, on a part of it? Because sometimes the trend will continue. I want to give myself the opportunity to take money off the table, get out of the risk zone. And in the event that this year is going to be different and continue higher, I want to give myself the opportunity to take more money off the table. Okay. All right. But well, we that, like, um, we've, we've got about four or five minutes. I just wanted to. Your point is your point is well taken, but here's here's been my biggest problem. 
It took me 15 years to realize that my big money is made in my big trades. And then unless I'm willing to risk giving some of that back on the last position, I'm not going to make the big money. But your question is very well, very good question. There was one other question that came into the room and it was, sure. about, it was about position sizing. So if you know going into your trade that you're only going to risk one and a half percent, do you back into your position size based on the amount of money? That Absolutely. You're yes. Absolutely. Okay. And I prefer to trade in units of three. One, to take my profit target off the table. Two, break even stop. Three, trailing stop locking in a percentage of the, of the profit. So let me show you a couple of more things. We can do the same thing in stocks. For example, 3M, November trade, 81.6% accuracy going back 50 years, 49 years. So again, the question is going to be psychological. Will it work this year? So you know the trade in advance. Let's see what happens this year. And again, I want to say this is very easy. It's based on seasonality. Seasonality is based on fundamentals. So ultimately, the fundamentals are there. I'm just trying to extract, extract the patterns using a search process that will allow me to make money with this trade. And I've done this for many years. It's been very consistent. Here's the entire track record of the, of the trade I showed you. I know we're running out of time, so if there's any questions, I'll be glad to take them. All right. Yeah, that would, uh, was a very uh, um, enlightening presentation. I know you, you follow a lot of rules, and just about everybody we've had on the show has their own set of rules that they follow. Um, and I know, Aaron, you know, uh, one of the folks you really like to follow is Dr. Alexander Elder because of, of rules and you know, trading based on certain rules. Um, when did you first, Jake, begin using these, this set of rules. I mean, everybody goes through periods. I'm sure you were no different <laughs> where you have to learn. You kind of have to learn as you go along. You pay a lot of tuition. When did you first follow, start following these rules? 1972. Really? When you started? No, I started in 67. 67. Okay. And it took me about five years to realize that I was following the wrong rules and I didn't even have any rules. I'd go to the library and look at chart books and say, well, there's a trend line. That looks pretty good. Oh, wait a minute. The trend line won't work unless you make it a little bit fatter. Let's make it fit. So that was my problem. And it wasn't until I went to the Mercantile Exchange and sat in the visitor's balcony one day and some guy said to me, what are your rules? Do they work? Do you know if they work? That the light bulb went on. And that's from that point forward, I started being more disciplined and more rule-based. Yeah, I think uh, another one of my fellow um, senior technical analysts here at Stock Charts, Dave Keller, um, he writes a blog here, The Mindful Investor, and he talks a lot about our personal biases that we have. And I think what you were just talking about, where you're fitting the line, you're making it, you're making it work based on what you think it's supposed to do. And that can be a really painful and expensive lesson. My worst trades have been on wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. So I try to be a numbers guy. If the rules don't work for me, they don't work. And it gives me a lot of peace of mind. Okay. So these uh, three, well, four websites that you have on here, this is how people would get a hold of you along with your phone number there. They want to read. Yeah, they can. And if anyone wants a PowerPoint presentation, I'll provide it to you guys or send it to them if they send me an email. Okay. Awesome. Well, I know Aaron does a, uh, a blog here for us for uh, Market Watchers Live. So maybe you could send those to her and she could incorporate that into um, the yes. blog. Let me say one more thing. Sure. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean to diss anyone else's trading style. I just have my trading style and I can only speak to what I do because it's done extremely well for me. I'm sure there's a lot of good stuff out there. I just don't know what it is. Some of it is artistic. Some of it is not. I'm just not an artist. I'm a numbers guy. Yeah. And I always say whatever works. I mean, exactly. I think things, different things work for different people, different strategies. I'm, I can be somewhat aggressive at times and somebody who's very conservative, not going to find my methods very um, profitable for sure. Sure, absolutely. It's like the LA way. Some people are really good at LA way. I'm not one of them. Right. Yeah, yeah. I have problems with it. I can feel it, it fit Elliot wave into whatever I want to see. <laughs> <That's> exactly. <laughs> and I don't mean to diss the Elliot wave people because I know some people who are really good with Elliot wave, but it's just, you know, it's not my thing. Yeah. Anyhow, really good to have you on here, Jake. Appreciate you, you spending your time here with us today and uh, hopefully you'll come back soon. Thanks very much for the opportunity, guys. You're doing a great job. I appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Jake. All right, Aaron, uh, it is time to move into the 10 and 10. You want me to take it away or do you have an RRG? 
I do have an RRG. I'll just show real quickly. I, I really wanted to point out the fact that uh, we're really starting to see that tech heavy requesting going on right now. Uh, pretty much <clears throat> dominating our, our request, but let's go ahead and get started. And the first one is Magellan Health Services, MGLN. Yeah, it's just kind of sitting here in this sideways consolidation, not really doing anything. And when you look at the relative strength relative to its uh, um, healthcare providers index, and then relative to the S&P 500, really last four, five, six months haven't been much. So I think until it gets out of this trading range and really defines whether it's in an uptrend or a downtrend, I would wait on the sidelines. I don't see anything here yet. All right. Let's see. Our most popular, and I don't know if you went over it already, Tom, uh, you talked about AMD. Would you like to do that one or the next uh, is APPS? Um, sure, I'll do AMD. Um, I right. would watch. I would probably watch. I'd, I'd like to see a reversal here on AMD before the day's out. Uh, to be quite honest, um, if you go back and you look at the recent lows here and you connect this trend line, I mean, you can see that if we were to finish with a hammer today, testing the 50-day, and come back up and close somewhere 31.75 to 32, I would be more bullish about the stock based on its action than if it finishes where it is today or lower. Um, just because, again, it's had multiple tests. I think this gets back a little bit to uh, Jake's point. I mean, if you're using um, you know, trend line here, you've had multiple tests and it's bounced exactly on this trend line. So if you get that reversal, you can manage your risk because you can use today's low as a, as a stop. If it doesn't, however, and it closes below, well, we've got a different animal. And I think that does raise more risk. I think what it would probably do is open up the possibility of a move down to test that June low, which is closer to $29. So I think this is going to be a big day for AMD. If it can get some buyers, get some support heading into the close, then I'd feel much better about it. All right. Let's see. Next one up, also a popular request, is APPS. That's a Digital Turbine, a software company. Yeah, that was my setup from last week. I haven't looked at it. By the way, you weren't here on Monday, but both of our setups did very well. Oh, good. Good yeah. to hear. Yeah, I think you had AAXN. I had APPS. Oh, yeah, APPS has taken back off again. Um, yeah, I, I like this move. It had come back down and it had tested that price support level. Let me annotate that. Um, and so I think it was right around 485 or so um, when we did the Monday setup. This was the day, I think. Um, and it, so it bounced off really nicely. It's been holding that 20-day moving average, which I, which I think is really good. And now it's broken back to new highs. And when you look at the relative strength, it is one of the strongest stocks in one of the strongest group software. So it's going to be hard not to like this one. I think it, it, at least for now, Wall Street loves it, and I think it goes higher. All right. Let's see. Next one would be ServiceNow, N-O-W. Yeah, this has been another one that's been a great performer. Um, it is coming down, testing the 50-day. Not sure. I don't think they reported earnings yet. I don't know if that was an earnings day or not. Uh, there have been so many companies reporting, I'm, I'm getting a lot of them confused. But um, I do like the test of the 50-day moving average. And I would just say this, it needs to hold the 50-day because over the last three weeks, we've seen this uh, relative weakness versus software. And that's okay. You know, you're not going to lead the index every single day or every week. But if you start to lose key support areas at the same time that you're losing relative strength, that's when I start to have a little bit of problem. So I would certainly keep an eye on that relative strength line. And then probably the most recent low, we've gone down and tested this area. I think if the stock were to close much below 270, um, I, would, I would probably reevaluate, maybe look for a different uh, software stock because that would combine a, a price breakdown along with the relative weakness we've been seeing. All righty. Next one up is Bed Bath, or Best Buy, BBY. All right, BBY. This one has been performing extremely well off of that June low. And you can see on a relative basis versus specialty retailers, not only have we been going up, but we have now reached about a seven-month relative high on uh, uh, Best Buy. So starting to show some really nice strength. One of the problems, however, is just the group's been weak. But as long as this continues moving in the right direction, it's an outperformer in the space. And as long as it doesn't lose any major support level, and I would just say that that support level for me would be its recent breakout, which is very close to its 20-day moving average. So there was the triple top, actually quadruple top, if you want to count this, 
We went through, could have used more volume. I'd feel better about it if it had been a big volume advance. But if we pull back, I want to hold $75. And the reason being, you're in a group that now has not been performing well. So if the money is not in the group and all of a sudden the stock fails to hold on to support, then I'm going to be a little bit more cautious. So I'd keep a tight stop. I think a close blow 75 would take me out here. All righty. Let's see the next one up and it's perking back up, but I don't think I'd want to be in this space. Abercrombie and Fitch ANF. Yeah, the space bothers me as well. Uh, yeah, it's perking up, but it's got overhead resistance and it's been perking up on less volume. I do not like this stock at all. Um, I don't know if I can be any clearer about that. <laughs> There's your gap down. I mean, look at the volume that came in. This is major distribution taking place. So I think 19 and a half to 20, if I held the stock or if I was in it and I was just trying to minimize losses, I think this area as it gets close to 20 is an area where I would be exiting. Uh, stage left. I mean, this does not look like a very good pattern. Volume has been dwindling as it's been making this move to the upside. I would either sell, <clears throat> excuse me, sell when I get close to 20, or I would sell at that recent low where we held the 20-day moving average right there. Um, I, I think we're in that range right now. We got a little bit more upside potential, but I'm not a big fan here. I would, I'm not a, I wouldn't be comfortable holding Abercrombie. Okay. The next one up has been in quite the trading range for the past three months. Uh, Kydel, Q-D-E-L. Yeah, downtrending with the overall market uptrending. Medical supply has been going up. The stock's been going down. And as a result, you can see it's just been absolutely horrible relative performance. It's trying to make a move to about a 10-month relative high. So maybe we'll uh, just take a look at that. Again, trying to bottom fish for relative strength is usually not something I try to do. I like to go with companies that are already showing nice relative strength. So this one's beginning to show it, but it's got some work to do. Um, it's coming up here. I think that the key area of resistance after it gapped down on big volume here at the beginning of May, we have not had a close over about 60 and a half. We're up there at 59.84 right now. Volume is light. Um, I'm not seeing anything just yet on this stock, so I, I would be looking elsewhere. Okay, let's see. Next one, I'm, I really like this chart, so that means you probably are going to hate it, but uh, Avon Products, AVP. Um, well, I'll tell you what, I don't always hate your stocks. <laughs> um, I actually like this stock. Did you say you like it? I do. I really like this one. I'm actually raising an eyebrow and thinking about going... Uh, and trading this one. Yeah, I like it. I think the, the difference in our strategies is sometimes your PP, uh, uh, the PMO. PMO, sorry, uh, just had a temporary <laughs> lapse of thought process. Your PMO, um, a lot of times when it turns up below the center line is when we have our differences because if it's mm -hmm. below the center line, a lot of times the overall momentum is down, even though it might be showing a little bit of short term strength. And so that's where I think we differ sometimes. But when you get a stock that's doing this, breaking out, and it's got great volume trends and it's in an uptrend, um, I'm going like to like it most of the time. And you can see relative strength breaking out to a new 52-week high. So, yeah, I mean, I like the volume trends. I like everything about this one. I think it looks good. Yeah, the PMO hasn't had the buy signal, but it's just about ready to click. And uh, that's what I always like to see. All right, uh, next one up is CTL. All right, CTL. Uh, this one's trying to break out of a bottoming reverse head and shoulder pattern. Um, you know, again, I'm not trying to bottom feed in a market that's been so strong. I think there's so many leaders. I don't want to try and catch a bottom. That's just really not my style. But if we had a really big volume, I'm talking 30, 40 million shares or more breakout, that to me would confirm that we're breaking out of this downtrend that CenturyLink's been in for a while. But it's a terrible performer longer term relative to its peers, relative to the S&P 500. Its group is not great. Um, there's just not a whole lot to like here unless it makes this breakout. So I think you're too early if you're trying to get in here. Um, I would want that confirmation that the downtrend has been broken. I'd like to see some heavy volume and a close over 1250. All righty. And we have one more to go. And that is Aerojet Rocketdyne AJRD. Yeah, this is in, I don't know if it's a uh, def yeah, defense group. Mm -hmm. um, been a great area of the market. I love defense stocks. This was a leader until this month. 
It's been pulling back, but since it's been pulling back, it's been doing so on light volume. I actually think this is a pretty good entry point. I like these pullbacks in leaders and especially on light volume. So, you know, when you, when you show relative strength, you're going to have these little pullbacks for a period of time. This one was a little bit lengthier, but we had a huge run for about 60 days. So I think that this is an interesting stock. And again, I, I like it at the 50 day moving average. I'd like it even more if the, if the 50 day had coincided with this price support. Uh, but I think 42 and a half down to 41 is that not a bad spot to be picking it up and, and building a position. Short term target would be at 47. I like it. I think it goes higher. All right. Excellent. And that does complete the 10 and 10. There are your symbols. They should be coming up here momentarily. Yep. I will have these up in the Market Watchers live chart list after the program. You can just go to the articles tab, click on that, find the Market Watchers live blog, and there you go. That's where you're going to find that link to the chart list. All righty. Can you believe this is really fast. This is my first time doing the show in, in the one hour time slot. <laughs> It's shockingly quick. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, we do have a poll today, though, and it's timely because the Fed's meeting in an hour. Yep. So we wanted to, yeah, we wanted to see what everybody else thought. Um, and it looks like the majority of you agree with the market that there's going to be a 25% or 25%, 25 <laughs> uh, reduction in the Fed funds rate. I agree with it, but I absolutely believe they should do 50. I think they should do 50, but I think they're going to do 25. Yeah, there seems to be a little bit of hawkishness, you know, in comparison to others. Uh, I I have to say, I think it's going to be that quarter. That's what I put in there. Um, I you know, I think that's a pretty good compromise <laughs> between doing nothing and lowering by a half of a point. It'll be interesting to see the market's uh, thoughts about that if it's a quarter and not uh, a half. Yeah, and the thing is, you know, when you look at what the Fed is up against your number one you've got the european central bank that is very very dovish and so i think the fed's got to be careful um if they're hawkish and other central bankers are dovish then you're going to be looking at a dollar that's going to continue to strengthen and the u.s dollar right now the index is threatening about a two-year high um and the problem with dollar going higher is that then you put downward pressure on the on commodities. And if commodities go down, where's the inflation? I mean, the Fed has two mandates. Their mandates are, number one, you want to maximize employment. And number two, you want to stabilize prices. And employment's not the problem. I think everybody will agree jobs market's been strong. Unemployment rate's very close to all-time lows or isn't at an all-time low. Price stabilization is the most important thing that I think the Fed needs to get right. And they're looking at inflation that's below their 2% target. That gives them the ability to lower. And I really think they should lower sooner rather than later. We'll see what they do at 2 o'clock. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I've got the 10-minute bars charts. Uh, it's 10-minute bar charts up here of all the markets right now. Uh, it's you know I've been really interested seeing that Russell 2000 and the mid-caps starting to really perk up as well. Yeah. And the Russell 2000, as I pointed out earlier, they've got a, that's a big level at about 1600. I mean, when you try to get through an area of resistance 10 times, <laughs> if you can ultimately do it, it make it's a big deal. Um, and we know the underperformance by small caps for a while. So that would be a big boost to the, to the stock market. I think if the small caps would break out. Absolutely. It's super close there. We just hit that 1600 mark again, it looks like. Yep. And I think that range was 1580 to 1620 right in there. So exactly. the three indices, the major indices all breaking out the new all-time highs. The Russell, nowhere near its all-time high yet. It's just trying to get above that intermediate high. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, again, want to thank uh, Jake Bernstein for joining us today. want to thank all of you for being with us as well. Please remember to complete the survey as you exit. As a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It is now just a 60-minute uh, show. Have a great uh, Wednesday afternoon, everybody. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Happy trading.